So just a quick summary of what we did in the last example. We worked out the Taylor series uh, centered at zero for the exponential function and the cosine function. These are what we call the Maclaurin series. We found that the exponential function's Taylor series at zero is given by x to the n over n factorial, where we're summing over n from zero to infinity, and the corresponding cosine one is here. Oh, a curious point to note, cosine's an even function, symmetric about the vertical axes, or in other words, if I pop in uh, things like, you know, if I pop in negative 15, that's the same thing as cos of 15. If I pop in negative pi, it's the same as cos of pi. So changing the sign of the x does not change the value that comes out. That's what we mean by an even function. That's reflected in its Taylor series. Notice that only the even powers survived. So we're calling cosine an even function. That's really, the words even is coming from the fact that only the even terms survive in the Taylor expansion. Now what about sine? Think about that. If we did the same thing for the sine function, sine is an odd function. What do you think about its Taylor series expansion? What terms should survive? What powers of x would be left? I'll leave that for you to ponder. Um, okay, so we've got these series expansions. Notice I was very careful when we work these things out not to write equality here. And the reason is, is because I don't know if they're equal. I don't know if they're equal. I don't know if the exponential function is actually equal to the values that come out of the series. For example, at this point, after I've constructed the series, I don't even know what the radius of convergence of this series is. So I don't even know if they're equal, and if they are equal, I don't even know what interval they will be equal on. So how do we know when we've constructed the Taylor series expansion if it is equal to the function itself, and for what possible x values? Does the equality hold? That's what we're going to talk about over these next few minutes. So a bit of terminology. We're going to call this polynomial, notice I've truncated the series. The series would be i going from 0 to infinity. Instead, if I chop off the tail end of the series, and I throw it away, and I just keep the first, in this case it would be going from 0 to n, so the first n plus 1 terms all the way up to the power of n, then that's a polynomial. And that's what we're going to call the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So here it is written out in full, the nth degree Taylor polynomial. And we just noticed that the limit as n goes to infinity of these nth degree Taylor polynomials gives us the Taylor series. So if we chop off the tail end of the series, then what we call that is just a Taylor polynomial. It's a polynomial, it's got finite many terms. In general, if we keep all the terms, that's the Taylor series. And as in our usual form, we can define the remainder as the difference between the actual value and the approximate value. And the approximate value here is using the nth Taylor polynomial. Now what we would like to know is, does think about the exponential case, does the Taylor series equal the function? Well, that's really asking, do the Taylor polynomials converge to the function? Well, an equivalent way to say, do the Taylor polynomials converge to the function, is say, does the remainder between the function and the Taylor polynomials go to zero? And so what we've just described here is this theorem. Suppose we can write the function as the sum of its Taylor polynomial with the remainder, and we know that the remainder goes to zero on the interval of convergence uh, for, the, for the series. So we know that this remainder goes to zero then we can say that the function is equal to its Taylor series on that interval. So answering the question about does the series converge to the function is really a question about do the remainders go to zero. We have a result due to Taylor known as Taylor's inequality, which helps us in showing that the remainders go to zero so that we do get this convergence of the series to the function. What Taylor's inequality says is if you can bound the n plus first derivative of the function on an interval around the point you've centered the series at, then the remainder, r sub n, is bounded above by that bound on the nth plus first derivative over n plus 1 factorial times the difference of x minus a on that interval. And so you can probably imagine, well, if you're trying to just find an upper bound on rn, you know the biggest x minus a could be is d, because x minus a is smaller than d. So this is really saying that the remainder is bounded above by the upper bound on the nth plus first derivative times 
the width or the radius of your interval that you're looking at, d, to the power of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. Now that's going to help us in showing that the Taylor polynomials converge to the function. So in other words, the Taylor series is equal to the original function on an interval. There's another fact we need, and that is that the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial is 0. So this is for any real number x. If we look at the sequence x to the n over n factorial, that's got to go to 0. In other words, the factorial on the bottom grows faster than the power function on the top. So let's see how we can put this into action for proving that the exponential function is equal to its Taylor series expansion for every real number x. So what we're trying to prove in this is that we do have the equality here. And that equality holds for all values of x. So in other words, I can evaluate e to the x by working out the series expansion for that particular x value. And moreover, remember that the Taylor polynomials are the things that are converging to the series. So what this also says is that if I want to approximate e to the x, like say I want to know what is e to the 10, well I could work out a polynomial, I just could truncate the series at some finite number of terms, plug 10 into that, plugging 10 into a polynomial, really easy to work out, all you need to know is multiplication and addition. And then there are inverse operations, which is uh, division and subtraction. But I can work out the value of e to the 10 by plugging 10 into some finite, well, plug 10 into the series, but I can approximate it by using only finite many terms. So this is, a, this is starting to indicate how we would use series expansions to approximate functions. OK, so how do we go ahead and show that we have a quality here? So in each case, whether it's A or B, we want to show that the limit as n goes to infinity of Rn of x equals 0. And in this case, we want to do it, since in both cases we're trying to show equalities for all x, we want to do this for all x in R. That's our goal. Try to show that the remainder goes to 0. And we have Taylor's inequality, which gives us an upper bound on the remainder. So again, let's remind ourselves with Taylor's inequality. Taylor's inequality says, I need to know the bound on the nth plus first derivative. But since I'm trying to show that the limit of the remainders goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, I really need to know an upper bound on all derivatives. So once I find my upper bound on all derivatives, I can work out the uh, nth remainder and then try to show the limit of the nth remainder is 0. So let's have a look. Our function is e to the x. Any derivative of that function is also e to the x. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work on some interval. So we're going to fix a number d and work on the interval x values less than d. So in other words, we're working on the interval negative d to d. Okay, so we're going to work on this interval. Later we're going to say, after we've done this, that our argument worked for any value d, so it works on the entire real line, for x on the entire real line. But right now we're just going to focus on some interval about where we centered the series at, and that was 0. Okay, so we fix the number d. Now on the interval, x less than d, we have that the nth derivative of x is bounded above by e to the d. Well, we know that the nth derivative is e to the x. And so if we're working on just an interval where the x value can be at most d, then the nth derivative is at most the value at e to the d. So it's bounded above by e to the d. And now by Taylor's inequality, we have that the nth remainder at x is bounded above by the upper bound on the derivatives. The derivatives are bounded above by e to the d over n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1. 
I want to work out what the limiting value of this is. What do the remainders do as n goes to infinity? I'd like to show that this goes to 0. So this is bounded above by the limit. It's also bounded below by 0. So I'm really using a squeeze theorem here. That this expression is trapped between 0 and this. And so the limiting value is trapped between 0 and the limiting value of this expression. So this is e to the d over n plus 1 factorial x to the n plus 1. Now, what do we know about this side? Well, this side here is equal to e to the d, the limit as n goes to infinity, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And that's where that other fact comes in that we had. The limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, that's 0. So that means that this thing is equal to 0. So what we have is that this expression goes to 0. This is already 0. And so our limit, which is trapped between 0 and 0, must also be 0. So by the squeeze theorem, the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth remainder at x is 0. And that's what we wanted to show. And that's what we wanted to show. So what that means is, therefore, the series x to the n over n factorial, n goes from 0 to infinity, that series, the remainder of the values I get, for any x value I pop into this thing, the remainder I get, oh, so, oh sorry, I should clarify, for any x value I pop into this thing that's smaller than d in magnitude, right? we had this thing here, smaller than d in magnitude. For any x value I pop into this thing with smaller than d in magnitude, the difference between the value I get in this series and the actual value of the function, which is e to the x, has to be 0. So they are equal. So this is equal to e to the x on the interval from x between negative d and d. But notice, in my entire argument, d never actually was needed, aside from just setting up these upper bounds. But once I took the limit, things went to 0. So this works for any value of d. So it means it works for all real numbers r. So this is for all x in r. So we've proven now that the Taylor series expansion for e to the x is exactly equal to e to the x. We can do the similar thing for the next function, the cosine function. In fact, I'm not going to write it out, but I'm going to show you the big picture perspective. How can we do the same thing? Well, let's look through the exponential one. What we needed to do is we needed to bound the nth derivative. So then I think for the cosine function, its derivatives are going to be well, sine, the, the sequence of derivatives would be derivative of cos is negative sine, then negative cos, then sine, then back to cos. And they just sort of cycle through sines and coses with plus or minuses appearing in front of them. What's the magnitude of sine and cos? Well, the biggest they could be is 1. So the biggest the derivative, any derivative of the cosine function, the biggest any derivative of it can be is 1. So in Taylor's inequality, this thing is going to be 1. And so what we have is that the remainder is bounded above by power of x over n, pl n plus 1 factorial. So the x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. We know those limits go to 0. So the exact same argument can work. We run through this. This thing would change. It would be a 1 now. This would be a 1 now. But yet the limits still go to 0. So the remainder would be 0. So by a entirely analogous argument, we get the equality here. And again, it didn't depend on d. In this case, it was actually 1 where we were going to use the value of d. In the cosine case, this had a value of 1. didn't depend on d in, at all, so this is true for all real numbers. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is a little bit subtle in what we're doing here. We're trying to show that we constructed the Taylor series and we do have equality. 
Having a quality really means showing that the difference between the series and the function is zero. Series can be thought of as a limit of these Taylor polynomials. So I'm really trying to show that the difference between the function and the nth Taylor polynomial, that difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller the more terms you use in the Taylor polynomial. So ultimately, if you use the whole Taylor series, the difference between the function and your Taylor series should be zero. How do we prove that? We're using things like Taylor's inequality and, that's, and the special limit of x to the n over n factorial. So all subtle details to establish the fact that we do have a quality in these cases.